Straight from the courtroom, law and crime reporter Megan Cuniff comes on to do a recap of the Tory Lanez trial and the incredible reaction after the verdict. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Long Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. As many of you probably saw, rapper Tory Lanez was convicted of three felonies out in Los Angeles for shooting Megan the Stallion back in July of 2020 after a get-together at Kylie Jenner's home. A jury found him guilty of assault with a firearm, possession of an unregistered firearm in a vehicle, and negligent discharge of a firearm, and that also his actions caused great bodily injury. Now, for Lanes, whose real name is Daystar Peterson, this could mean over 22 years in prison. By all accounts, this was quite a wild and unpredictable trial, and we're told that when the verdict was read, the courtroom turned a bit chaotic. But with no cameras allowed, you might be saying, how do you know that? Well, that's because we have the terrific reporting from law and crime senior reporter Megan Cuniff, who was inside that courtroom for the whole trial, and she joins me right now. Megan, the reporter. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I want to do a bit of a trial recap, but before we do that, uh, what happened in the courtroom when the verdict was read? Uh, yeah, I mean, like a lot of family members, when a verdict is read, uh, Lanes's father had a, a real emotional reaction, but it was also quite angry and, and very loud. And it was also... it happened a, a few seconds after the verdict was read. I mean, it was kind of almost a calm yet furious reaction by him where he just rose from his seat and just started screaming about this wicked system. And uh, he he talked outside about uh, how he has thousands of sons across the world. And I think he was alluding to his work as as a preacher because you could it definitely had tones of that in the courtroom, but everybody was pretty rattled by it because it was so loud. And then the big problem was there weren't enough sheriff's deputies in there. They weren't prepared for that kind of scene. They had six deputies in there, which was the same number of deputies that they had in Harvey Weinstein. And he's, you know, 70 and in a wheelchair. So it took them a few minutes to kind of get everybody under control because Lane's had a lot of supporters in there and and they weren't being violent there was no kind of physical confrontation but the father did approach the prosecutors with his finger out saying you know you're evil you know exactly what he what you've done and just how loud he was and then the the time that it took deputies could to kind of control everything is kind of what scared everybody because they've got to get those people under control. But at the same time, they need to keep a hand on lanes because it was a given that he was going to be taken into custody. So it was just kind of a chaotic scene from the deputies, but who through no fault of their own, they were all doing a good job. There just wasn't enough of them. You know, were you nervous? Yeah, people who were sitting right near it were nervous. And somebody told me afterward who knows them that, you know, nobody was in any danger in there. And it's not like he ever got physical with anyone. But of course, we don't know these people. And just with the uh, vitriol against the press and everything that's going on, we were, you know, we were nervous that he would start, you know, yelling at us or, or something like that. Uh, you know, he did turn to the audience and just but he was just really furious about what happened. And they seem to think it's a it's a really big injustice, which is interesting when you look at the evidence. I want to get into that before we do the jury, right? So the jury comes out, they're asked, is this your verdict? My understanding from your reporting is there was uh, the way they said yes was different by, for each juror. So what was their reaction, the jurors reaction to a what was going on after the verdict was read? What were they doing? And B, uh, what how, when they said that this was their verdict, can you tell us what they what their reaction was? Yeah, it was all happening so fast. And I've heard from a few people that the jury was all the way out of the courtroom when the father's reaction started. But still, there's no way they didn't all hear it from the hallway. But when they all came back in, the the foreman was a, a 30 year old guy kind of had kind of a, a video gamer vibe to him. But just the look on his face when he stood up, you know, you could tell they were taking this really seriously and the, the three guilty verdicts. And when they went around and did the polling, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, there were uh, it was definitely a, a multiracial jury. You had a lot of diversity on there. And there was an older black man who uh, he would sometimes wear shades. He usually had them up on his uh, head, but sometimes he would have them on in the beginning. And, you know, he was kind of a mystery to some people because he had a cough that was, you know, causing all sorts of speculation and the, uh, in the gallery. But when they did the poll and they asked if, is this your verdict? He really barked. Yes. He's just said yes. And I thought it was, um, you know, it, it, usually with juries, especially being 
you know, a, a white person kind of coming from a, a maybe a white privileged background, I'm not always in tune to describing the race of juries. I mean, it, it kind of makes me uncomfortable to do that. But there is such an obvious racial component to this thing. And I had kind of wondered that if, you know, some of the especially an older black man like that would not approve of this defense that Tory put on uh, what he was accused of doing and then how he kind of cast the blame on the black women that he had victimized. Were you surprised by the verdict? Because let's now get into the evidence. What was the most significant piece of evidence you think maybe for this jury that ultimately said uh, Mr. Peterson committed these crimes? I mean, what was the most significant piece of evidence for you uh, by this verdict? For me, it was the apology call. And and we didn't actually hear a whole lot about that during trial because I think prosecutors just kind of figured, why bother? I mean, if they they played it in the opening. They got it in evidence from somebody within the jail. And then it kind of seemed like it was on the defense to try to explain that away. Because while he never mentions uh, a shooting or a gun in the call, uh, it, the prosecutor even said in his closing argument that he'd gone over it a few times with his co-counsel, and they just can't figure out what else he could be talking about in this call. And they went through it line by line, focused on how he's asking about how Meg's in the hospital. This is his apology call to Kelsey. And we never really seemed to hear much about that from the defense in trial. Like They really needed to explain what that call was. And it was kind of just left unopened until prosecutors brought it up a- again in the closing argument, because there was a lot of focus on Kelsey's recant on the stand and then the testimony from the neighbor. And I think all of that was important. But in the end, Tory himself provided a ton of evidence for this just through his text messages to Meg and then his phone call to Kelsey. Yeah, because that for me, I was you know following the trial too. the apology call, the text messages from the defendant himself. Very hard to explain that away. I thought the Kelsey Harris testimony, the Sean Kelly testimony, the friend and the neighbor was totally confusing. It was inconsistent. I think it blew up a lot of the prosecution's case. A part of me was a little surprised by the verdict because of that testimony. Did you not? What did you think about that? Oh, I figured and I I figured he'd be found guilty. I I mean, I thought maybe there was a one in 10 chance you'd be able to get a a hung jury. But sitting in the opening statement, when I heard that phone call, I mean, I really did go. I mean, mean, oh, my God. I mean, his 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 apology call is like, what? Why are we even here? Why didn't he take a plea deal? And then his lawyer uh, just having coming from a background of the L.A. Daily Journal where we're covering the elite criminal defense attorneys, I was like, wow, this guy seems to be a little rough around the edges in his approach to this case. And I was also struck by how much attention the defense seemed to be focusing on all the social media stuff. They were, I saw some trial transcripts being floated around social media that I think pretty obviously came from the defense. And I I thought it was remarkable that they were being floated around in social media, kind of trying to sway the public opinion on it. But then I I don't think George McDesion, the defense attorney, had any kind of PowerPoint during his defense closing argument. I mean, it really seemed like kind of a, a piecemeal, like I'm not sure how much actual lawyering and work and preparation was put in to the defense. But then it, they, he also just seemed to have, I mean, bad facts. I mean, what can you do when you have a phone call like that, uh, a, an apology call like that? You can try to explain it a little bit better, which he didn't. But I mean, what can you say about it? Yeah. And, and, and we have about a minute left. I want to ask you, I mean, you had Sean Kelly, this neighbor talking about that. He saw Lane's, you know, short guy, right? So Lane's was firing. Um, but then he also said that he th- thought he saw a muzzle flash from Harris. You had Harris who recanted and said that she uh, didn't see Lane's with a gun the night that Megan was shot. It was inconsistent with what she originally told investigators. I mean, where do you stand on their testimony? Um, were they telling the truth? What do you think? What do you, I don't, I'm confused by it. The big thing is demeanor and recants like Kelsey's recant happen, not so much in celebrity high profile cases a lot, but they happen in gang and domestic violence cases all the time. And that's why there's case law that allows the prosecutors to go back and ask her about her inconsistent statements. And the big thing there was Lane's his own attorney, who, like I said, compared to some of the other criminal defense attorneys, I said, seems a little rough around the edges, badgered her so much about prosecutors uh, badgering her in the interview that it enabled them to 
play the entire September interview unedited, which would not have happened in any other case. But jurors were able to hear her, hear her demeanor, and then compare that to her on the witness stand. And I've heard from a lot of prosecutors say, you know, there's such a big deal made about witness recants, but especially with the previous statement, most of the time for jurors, it's obvious. And the prosecutors really focused on ex- using Megan's own testimony to explain why Kelsey did what she did up on the witness stand, just talking about the uh, reluctance within the black community to, to cooperate with law enforcement, that kind of thing. Well, it sounded like an incredible trial. Um, Megan, you were our eyes and ears inside that courtroom. Great reporting. And uh, this story is not over because, again, we have to see what his sentence will actually be. And I'm sure there will be appeals process as well. Megan, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. And that's all we have for you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here on Sidebar. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.